Welcome to Camp Crystal Lake on Wrestling with Horror. I'll be your counselor and guide through the tales of terror that all transpired during the month of fright, culminating in one night where the passage between the land of the living and the dead is lowered and the spirits of the departed run amok. Or, if you don't believe in the supernatural, there's enough real-world horrors to make the hair on the back of your neck stand up and double-check all the locks in your house. Story number one. I'm a 28-year-old female, and I've always enjoyed Halloween. First, let me say I'm not your typical pumpkin spice and Ugg boots cliche in the fall. I'm more of a horror marathon and haunted house type much to the chagrin of my closest friends who can't understand my love for all things scary. So now that you have a little background on me, I'll recount the scariest thing that's ever happened in my life thus far. I somehow convinced a good friend of mine, we'll call her Sherry, to visit one of my favorite things in October, a haunted attraction. The one we'd be traversing through is massive and one of the top rated in the US it took me a full week to convince Sherry to accompany me. And this is the point where I admit that if I wasn't single, this whole event never would have taken place. I honestly feel like the man, and I'm assuming it was a man given his size, wouldn't have done what he did if I was with a boyfriend as opposed to another woman. It's also of note that we're very small in stature. Neither of us is over five foot three, or weigh more than 110 pounds. The night we went to the haunted house was cool and crisp, not too cold or warm, just a pleasant October night, which always makes it more enjoyable when you're not battling the weather on Halloween. Sherry and I made the drive to the attraction, which was about 20 minutes from my house. The whole drive was lighthearted conversation and laughs. Even when we got there, it seemed as though Sherry was going to enjoy this as much as I was which made me happy considering her previous reservations about accompanying me on this journey. I grabbed our tickets and we jumped in line. We kind of got caught up in the atmosphere. Given the excitement of the others in line, with our anticipation growing, and we both shared sips from a mixed drink I put into a water bottle and had stuffed in my hoodie, I figured a little bit of alcohol would loosen Sherry up and help us enjoy the thrills of being safely terrified in this setting. We hand over our tickets, have our last minute instructions, and make our way in. The dim lights, sound effect, smoke, and overall ambience were an assault on the senses. And they create the struggle between the part of your brain that says, this isn't real, and the other part that tells you, run or you're going to die. It's also noteworthy to mention that in this particular attraction, the actors are allowed to touch you, but if you touch them back, you're immediately ejected. Sherry had joked around about slapping anyone who touched her, but she knew she couldn't do that because neither of us wanted to fork over $50 and then not get our money's worth. The actors, the costumes, the blood and gore effects were enough to give me nightmares, but Sherry was reduced to tears within minutes due to the visuals and aggressive nature of the actors. We were entering a long hallway, and I'd be remiss if I said it didn't remind me of the hospital Rick woke up in in The Walking Dead. Dimly lit, flickering lights, wires hanging from the ceiling, dilapidated appearance, and everything to bring the aesthetic to life. Sherry was behind me, and as we slowly moved forward through the narrow corridor, and in between the flickering of the lights, I noticed a man in all black with a skull mask on poke his head out of a hallway door. Normally, this wouldn't have raised any red flags. Except for in this particular attraction, no one had that basic of a costume on. They were all cinema quality effects and wardrobe. But here was this hoodie and skull mask you could buy at your local store. Uncharacteristically for me, I got a cold chill across my body, so I squeezed Sherry's arm and leaned into her that someone is hiding up there and I don't think they're part of the attraction. Sherry froze immediately in place. She pulled me close to her by my sweatshirt and said, What do you mean? I repeated myself that I saw someone stick their head out twice since we've been in this hallway, and I don't think they're dressed well enough to be part of the haunt. 
Even in the dark, I could see the blood drain from Sherry's face as her expression went from bewilderment to sheer horror. At this point, we could have called for one of the uniformed workers who would escort you to what they refer to as chicken doors, so you could simply leave the attraction without finishing the tour, or move forward past the point where this unknown person was hiding and hope we weren't followed. And now I'm glad we didn't pregame more heavily before entering the attraction. We decided, well, I decided for us that it made no sense how some random crazy person would slap down 50 bucks, attempt to hide in an attraction with dozens and dozens of employees in hopes of accomplishing what? Robbing? Abducting someone? In my head, as aware as I am of my surroundings, I never saw this as a plausible scenario, which is why what happened took place. We're slowly walking down the hall. The door where the person was hiding was no more than 10 feet in front of us. Sherry and I were basically a single entity at this point because we were huddled together on the left side of the hall to try to stay as far away from the door as possible. In our 110 pound minds, this would make us harder to grab, but I was wrong. We were parallel to the door and no more did I glance to the right at the open doorway in the pitch black room, in an instant, a flash of white surrounded by inky black lunged, grabbing my arm and shoulder hard. I screamed, as did Sherry. The assailant was undeterred by this, as I guarantee in his mind he thought because all the other noises and screams that it wouldn't draw any attention. In the dim lights of the hallway, I finally got a clear look at the man's stature as he had a hold of me. He had to be at least six foot five. The weirdest thing is, he made no sounds. And his mask had those mesh coverings over the eyes. So in the instant that I did look into his mask, where his face should have been, I saw nothing but blackness. I know he was trying to pull us into that room because after I thought about what happened, there was nothing in that hallway until we rounded the corner and walked about another 25 feet. It was supposed to build the next scare and let me tell you, there's nothing scarier than an attempted abduction when all you want is fake blood and gore. We screamed until we were both almost hoarse and he must have gotten scared that someone else would show up because in an instant he let go of my arm and shoulder and proceeded to double arm shove me into Sherry causing us both to fall over after we collided with one another. He ran down the hall and was gone. We never saw him again. After we gathered ourselves and before anyone else entered the hallway we got to the next scare and begged for a plain clothes employee and security to report what had happened. We were visibly shaken, crying, frightened. The employees and their security contacted law enforcement, who did little to nothing to alleviate the situation upon arrival. Needless to say, they didn't shut the attraction down, but they did a sweep of the grounds, which yielded no results predictably, meaning this attacker escaped with no repercussions. Sherry and I drove home in silence, and needless to say, that experience alone was enough to sour me on ever visiting another haunted house attraction again. At this point, I'm good staying in and watching my horror on television in the form of movies. Story number two. I was 11 years old when this story took place, which was in 2005. So if you're doing the math, that means I'm now 30 years old and this memory has never left my subconscious. I'm a man now with a family and kids and still love Halloween the same way I did when I was 11 years old and a goofy kid who spent hours drawing monsters and nightmare creatures watching horror movies, then annoying my friends with all the knowledge I had of the productions, stuff that most quote-unquote normal kids couldn't possibly be interested in. 
It was finally Halloween, and two of my best friends from my class and I were finally allowed to go trick-or-treating without a parent accompanying us around our neighborhood, which I should clarify was your average middle-class suburb. Our parents were all hanging out in our garage, passing out candy and costumes, music playing as they passed the candy out to the kids who would stop by, and we lived in a fairly tight-knit block, the kind where most everyone knew each other and looked out for all the kids in the neighborhood. So when the adults my parents knew would bring their kids by, they'd usually stay for a drink with my folks. My parents were in full-on party mode when they said goodbye as Gage, Anthony, and myself set off on our annual quest for all the candy we could fit into our bags. The first part of the night was uneventful, just traveling door to door, making sure to thank everyone. We occasionally bump into a group of kids from our class, walk together for a little bit, then break back off into our individual groups and be on our separate ways. One such meeting of friends saw me, Gage, and Anthony run into our friends Danny and Cameron. They immediately told us they were being followed by someone wearing one of those weird Cupid doll masks. You know, the white ones with the non-pronounced features except for the lips and puffy cheeks. Nothing much stood out, but this guy didn't have anything else resembling a costume. Just dark jeans and a dark hoodie. They said this wouldn't have bothered them as much, but the fact that this person wasn't carrying a bag, a pillowcase, nothing to indicate they were trick-or-treating at all. Anthony spoke up first, asking Danny if he thought he was someone from our school, just messing around with them. Maybe one of the older kids from the high school wanting to pilfer our sugary goodness? Cameron jumped in and said no way, not the way this guy was acting and moving. Just then, I noticed over my friend Gage's shoulder the same man Danny had just described. It wasn't dark yet, but it was to the point where unless you're in a well-lit area, it's difficult to see by the natural lighting alone. He was standing in a patch of trees across the street in a lot that had an under-construction home on it. His white mask was the one thing that stood out the most. That and the fact that I'm 100% sure he saw me looking at him. I quietly told my friends that he was watching us and that we should all stay together and make our way back to my house and that my mom and dad would contact Danny and Thomas's parents to come get them due to the circumstances. If you're wondering, it was the early 2000s and not every 11 year old had an iPhone. If we did, this whole situation would have been over much quicker than it was. The five of us were still on the street. The masked man was still watching us when the group started the four block trek back to the safety of my driveway where our parents were blissfully unaware that we were being stalked. We had to walk straight for one block and the man was on the opposite side of the street walking at a decent pace, almost to match our hurried gait. Luckily, the street was still fairly busy with kids and parents out enjoying the holiday, which I feel ultimately saved us in the end. By the time we reached the end of the first block, we made a left turn into a little less populated part of the neighborhood at this point. It was dark, and I looked across the street, and there he was unapologetically staring through his mask at us, which made me tell everyone to move quicker without sprinting. I thought if we didn't full-on sprint, he wouldn't just run after us, even though he was already moving at the exact same pace that we were. End of block two. Following this turn, it would be a two block straightaway back to my house. Needless to say, we were terrified at this point. Danny glanced back over his shoulder as we turned the corner and yelled, SHIT! He was on the same side of the street as us. He said it loud enough, Thomas, Gage, and Anthony broke into a full sprint towards my house, screaming their heads off. Danny and I froze momentarily, as did the man following us. Then, after what seemed like less than a second, he charged at us. 
we both turned into Olympic athletes at that moment, or at least that's what it felt like. If you've never been chased, and I mean really chased, where you're in fear of physical harm, you understand the feeling when your adrenaline takes over. Looking back, I'm sure the man thought now that there was only two of us again. Taking at least one of us wouldn't be a problem, and that emboldened him. By the time we could clearly make out my house, and my garage in particular, all five of us were screaming our heads off, and I remember seeing Anthony's dad come down the driveway to see what was happening. He didn't have to wait long to find out the problem. Because five out-of-breath, terrified 11-year-olds were all telling him at the exact same time. I looked back and the man was gone. All of our parents were listening to our retelling of the events and about the man with the mask. And shockingly, they all took it seriously. My dad called the police and while they were en route, along with Gage and Anthony's dad, they went looking for the man who chased us. The police arrived and they canvassed the area. And to no surprise, they found nothing. I don't know what he had planned but I'm glad I never found out, especially given the fact he chased us almost to my front door. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed those two stories. I haven't done a video like this in a while, so I figured what better time of year to unleash a little bit of terror that's reality-based than October, right? If you enjoyed this, if you want more content like this, you guys know what to do. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Be sure to hit that like button, subscribe, tune in for the show tonight, 8.35 Eastern, tomorrow night, Tuesday night, Terror Vision. Trina and I will be joined by Tommy and the Guinea Pig Collective, and we'll be reviewing Spirit Halloween, the movie. Thank you so much to all our channel members, Patreon backers, and everybody else who just tunes in to watch the shows and enjoys the content. Have a great day. Stay safe. Stay spooky. And remember, it's always better to burn out than fade away.